Have you ever had a game that you've known about for ages and always wanted to play, but just never had the time? Well, for a while now, this was my experience with Plock, an obscure SNES platformer which unfortunately got outshined by the likes of Mario, Sonic, and... Bubsy? The fuck? I've set aside some time to finally try out this little game starring an executioner in a McDonald's uniform to see what it's all about. Look, there he is. He's, he's got a McDonald's uniform on. <laughs> So, what is Plock all about? Plock was birthed from the minds of the Pickford brothers, specifically John and Steve. Plock was originally posed to star in the late 80s coin-op game, Fleep It, but due to Zippo Games going out of business, the project was unfortunately scrapped. The original concept of Plock was a character that wore a hangman's hood, who could detach his limbs and use them as an offensive tool. Remind you of anyone? Thankfully, they've archived a lot of information and original design sketches from this era of Plock to their website, Z3. Well, there he is, the first ever sketch of Plock. Really digging those other mitts, dude. I really love how solid he is here, and Ninja Plock looks pretty cool too, even if he looks like he's wearing a gimp suit, and... Is that... Bender Plock? Bite my shiny metal- Supposedly during development, Miyamoto had taken a strong interest in Plock and wanted to help the team out with development and publishing. Even stating that Plock was already the third best platforming game behind Mario and Sonic, <laughs> and wanted to help the team elevate it to the number two spot, knocking Sonic down a peg, but obviously not being their golden boy Mario. Naturally, the Pickfords were ecstatic about this. However, Nintendo eventually dropped out due to Plock being very similar to another game they were working on, which turned out to be Super Mario World 2: Yoshi's Island. Nintendo still published the game in Europe, with Trade West publishing in America and Activision in Japan. Have you seen the Japanese box art for Plock? This sh is wild. It's a little too cutesy for my liking, however in America and Europe, Plock looks fucking pissed. He's over blood. Like most people, I first heard about this game's existence through its soundtrack, but we'll get to that later on. I was recently lurking through my local sex shop. No, not that sex shop. I visit sex. Do I look like I have sex? Don't answer that. Anyway, I noticed I had a copy of Plock on the shelf for a whopping 8 quid and just had to get it. Due to be behind glass, I had to go up to the counter and ask for one Plock, please, and the guy gave a look with nothing short of disgust on his face. 8 British pounds and a stab wound lay and I had myself a copy of Plock. My life finally has meaning. When you first start the game, you greet this lovely message from John and Steam. Thanks, guys. Really touching stuff. So, this is Plock, and I already like this dude, he's really jamming out on this harmonica. You're then shown an extensive demo that details the game's plot and Plock's abilities. As this is a 90s SNES platformer, I'm sure you'll be surprised to know that this game doesn't have all too much of a story. But our friend Plock here is the self-proclaimed ruler of the acrylic island, and he loves flags. Like, really loves flags. Particularly this one. And he also fucking hates fleas. The game's manual thankfully points this out to us, because I had no idea. However, one bright sunny morning, Plock awakes to find that his precious flag has been nicked, and naturally is fucking livid about this. After spawning on the nearby Cotton Island, he sets sail in order to retrieve it. After kicking about on Cotton Island for a bit, Plock runs into the Bobbins Bros, two ex-circus freaks turned thugs for hire, and upon defeating them, gets his flag back. After sailing back home, which apparently takes him all night, even though it clearly took him like two seconds to get there in the first place, never mind. Plock realises that he's been duped, and that in his absence, the entire island of acrylic has been overrun with fleas. And I'm not sure if you know this, but Plock fucking despises fleas. You'll then travel across acrylic, taking out these flea bastards, heading through beaches, towns, caves, and forests, as well as taking out a few bosses along the way, ultimately ending up in the flea pit. I should probably discuss what Plock is capable of. By pressing B, Plock will jump. What the f Pressing Y, Plock will shoot one of his limbs, a whole two years before Rayman could, hit an enemy and it will immediately return to Plock. However, if you miss, it will take a few seconds for it to fly back, which you can use to your advantage by positioning yourself so it'll give them a good thump in the noggin on its way back. This adds some great strategic elements to the game, although if you're anything like me, you'll probably end up just matching Y until you finally hit the target. However, this can be damning, because if you fire off all your body parts at once, you'll be left with just a torso which handles like complete ass, with certain levels taking advantage of this, for better or worse. Yeah, I'm looking at you go home, Kevin. Pressing A, Plock will do a somersault, which allows him to jump higher, but you can't attack. Holding down on the D-pad while in midair will make Plock plummet to the ground, which makes platforming a bit snappier. And I really wish more platformers did this. It's seriously a great feature. 
In some stages, you'll find these little hornet nests, and upon collecting them, they'll fly around with Clock. By pressing X, you'll send one of these lads out, and they'll go attack anything that's on screen. If there's nothing on screen for them to murder, they'll just chill with Clock until their next victim appears. Uh, this is your health. You can heal by grabbing these purple fruit. Huh. Well, I'll be damned. As well as by grabbing the flea flag that's in the stage. Top right is your life count and how many plot tokens you have. Collecting all of them will earn you a plot continue, allowing you to carry on after a game over. Uh, top left is your meaningless score, and by now you've probably noticed the shells that are scattered around each stage. Collecting these fills up the plot head at the top of the screen. You'll get a bonus plot if you fill it. And plot can also grab shells by shooting his limbs at them. Scattered around at some levels, you'll also find power-ups to help you out on your adventure. We've got Squire Plock, dawning a deer stalker on a goddamn blunderbuss. Vigilante Plock, which lets Plock become Pyro. Plocky, which allows you to infinitely fire boxing gloves in two directions. Rocket Plock, which is like Plocky, but you get to fire in four directions. And last of all, Cowboy Plock, which is no doubt the most useful one. I wish that these were available more often throughout the game, as they're really useful. Hell, I don't have any idea how to get this one in the creepy forest. But with the limited amount, I suppose it makes it a bit more special when you get one. You'll also find these saw blades, and upon touching it, Plock will do his best impression of Sonic. So, Plock seems very capable. I'm sure this game's a piece of piss. Unfortunately not, my friend. You're gonna need all those extra lives, as Plock is a fragile little f***. If you're not careful, your health can deplete in a matter of seconds due to all the shit you'll encounter on your journey. Well, you've got spikes, water, seeds, heads appearing out of the ground, bees, logs, eldritch abominations, fleas, logs, these fuckers, whatever the fuck this thing is, whatever the fuck that thing is, even the goddamn flowers when you're dead in this game. And did I mention the logs? Yeah, it's no secret this game has a few beginner traps. Mainly, these fucking logs! They're just thrown at you with very little warning, and I don't think it'd be nearly as bad if there was a sound effect that played just before they were on screen to give the player a little warning. To top it all off, Plock has a very, very small number of iframes, and when you're getting projectiles thrown at you from everywhere, this can easily lead to an early grave. Did I also mention this game doesn't have a save feature? Or passwords! <laughs> yeah, according to John Pickford, the publisher won't pay the extra fee to include a save battery in the cartridge. Which only cost one dollar, by the way. And John was incredibly against passwords, so if you're gonna beat this game, you got to do it all in one go. Well, you could just use save states, I'm not gonna stop you. Personally, I don't find the game overly difficult. The challenge is just right for me, but there are certainly things in this game that will test you. If you find the game is just too hard, you can always try it the child's play mode, which may just be the most insultingly easy difficulty mode I've ever seen. I tried this mode out just for curiosity's sake, and my god, enemies move incredibly slow and they're easier to take down. You can thankfully take out the logs, and you end up missing about half the game. It just ends after crashing rocks and basically tells you you're a big old bitch and you should try the real game. As I mentioned before, you start your adventure on Cotton Island. This place does a pretty good job of introducing you to Plock and his world, with its bright and colourful settings, bouncy music, and LOGS! <coughs> Sorry. The Cotton Island levels are pretty straightforward. Just get to the end and retrieve your flag, which is usually something else entirely. Or, you know, you could just fucking not, and instead head left and find this tree. Certain fruits will take you to a secret warp stage by hitting them enough times, which there are two types of. Racing involves you using a different vehicle to reach the end under a time limit, and shell collecting, which is... Easier said than done, as the timing on these can sometimes be incredibly strict. Look at this one, I beat it on the last fucking frame. At the end of the island, you're running to the bobbins. These guys fucked me up a few times before I could get a good strategy down. If you hit them, they'll jump, so use that to your advantage. I find it best to hit them both and run underneath them, then rinse and repeat until they're both dead. When you get back to acrylic, this is when the real game begins, as you're introduced to the fleas. These little blue hell raisers are your main enemy in this adventure. And while you can take them out fairly easily, they hop all over the damn place and have so many fucking iframes. I guess that explains why Plock has so few of them. Not only did they steal his flag, they also stole his fucking iframes. The first two levels also do a pretty good job in helping the player understand how to beat these stages. Just kill all the fleas and get to the end. Thankfully if you die, all the fleas you've killed won't respawn, but as there aren't any checkpoints, you'll still have to beat the entire level. Uh, more on this later on. 
You're also introduced to the target mechanic, where a plot will hit a target and something in the environment will change, such as an object shifting, a platform appearing, or a new path will open up. Hitting a target will cause you to lose the arm or leg you hit it with, and can be retrieved from a coat hanger, which is usually nearby. Get used to this as certain stages like Creepy Crag and Go F*** Yourself Cavern like to take advantage of this mechanic. After respectfully removing a few of them from his island, he decides to have a kip and dreams of his grandpappy's search for the lost amulet, where you then get to play as grandpappy Plock himself. The gameplay changes back to how it was on Cotton Island, just get to the end of the stage, but instead of raising a flag you'll dig for some dirt. I do find some of the items he digs up to be pretty funny though, like the shoe and the one ton weight. This portion of the game is incredibly charming, and they even went out of their way to change certain elements, such as the plock icons now having a neat moustache. I'm sure 2012 Tumblr would have loved that. The whole game turns to black and white, and the entire font changes to be a bit more... traditional. Even the title cards of each stage are made to look like silent movie era cards. Eventually, Grandpappy runs into the Bobbins, who have a third member this time, Irving, oh, and after giving them the old 1-2 and defeating them for the second time but really for the first time, ends up finding the lost amulet. So I guess it's just the amulet now. Plock wakes up and holy shit, my eyes! After playing in black and white for so long, the colours really pop out. Plock finds the amulet underneath the grandpappy Plock statue that's outside his house, and continues his flea bloodlust. So now that we have the not so lost amulet, Plock gains the ability to get really pissed off and turn into Sonic on command. Just mash away at those LNR buttons and watch as your enemies turn into red mist. This is powered by the shells you collect. But I'm honest, I hardly ever use this ability mainly because I usually forget I have it, although it is great for taking out fleas. All the levels from here on out are very diverse in setting. We go through Plock Town, self-proclaimed obviously, before running into the Penkinos. These jelly bean fellas are a group of magicians that are probably someone's fetish. This boss fight incorporates the targets I mentioned earlier. This one could be a bit finicky as oftentimes they'll fly above or under the spikes you've got to hit them with, all while avoiding projectiles from above. Thankfully it doesn't take much to take them out though. Here's a tip for you, if you hit the target four times, the spikes will shoot four times, so don't think it'll only shoot out once. When you're done with them, you'll go for a few more levels taking out fleas. I do quite enjoy Venge Thicket and Dreamy Cove, just make sure you don't let a flea jump down from the top route, because it's a pain to get back up there again. But then you enter the creepy forest, and well... F*** this place, I don't like it. You got these flowers that take forever to kill, all while shooting out more flowers that damage you, and then those flowers shoot out seeds! There's times where it feels like it's a fucking bullet hell. It's especially painful as you also have to deal with these slow ass revolving doors that take an eternity to let you through. If you're feeling ballsy though, you can just brute force your way through. You'll then run into Womack the Spider. He's really not too tough, although the amount of projectiles he can shoot out later on in the fight can overwhelm you. It's easy to learn when he's going to shoot out his peas though, so before he shoots, jump and you'll be able to easily avoid them. Next up we have Creepy Crag, which is a pretty fun stage. It's very vertical and involves you losing your limbs in order to get to the top. But then all that fun is stripped away because f you, it's Go Home Cavern. See this dickhead? This place is plastered with these motherfuckers. You have to hit twice in order to kill them. Okay, seems simple enough. It's not like we haven't encountered them before. But this time, they have a shield, so you have to hit them from behind, which isn't exactly easy. However, when you do hit them, they'll turn around and fly up into the air, which makes killing these guys a real bitch. Although you can get pretty lucky from time to time. After a bit of frustration, you get a gem which makes you invincible for about 0.2 seconds and you can climb up to the next part of the level, which then immediately takes away your legs. Bring it on! So you end up spending most of your time hopping around for half the stage with about a quarter of the control you had up until now. I just recommend ignoring all the enemies you can until you get your legs back, and this part can really f***ing suck at times. As long as you know that jumping after sliding will make you go further, these jumps aren't too bad. With enough patience you can get through it, but please don't die near the end of the stage, just don't. Otherwise you have to do the whole thing with no legs again, because there are no checkpoints. Yeah, well, other than that, it's not so bad. Well, at the very least, crashing rocks is a pretty enjoyable time, which is the last traditional stage of the game. The theming of this level is actually really pleasant, and I love the colours in the background. I'm a sucker for nice sunsets, can you blame me? These waves always catch me off guard while trying to kill the fleas, and what in the f*** are these things? I do not even want to know. Yeah, I like this stage, although I can never seem to beat it without dying first. You'll then run into Rocky Fella, a bigger... Rock Fella, who lives in the ground of acrylic. This fight really isn't too bad, it can just take a while, especially if you die. It's pretty easy to take down, all things considered, though. Ugh, I don't like that. Why does he look like he's sucking a lemon? 
So you've gone through all of acrylic, taken out thousands of fleas and multiple bosses, and you've arrived at the flea pit. But wait! There are actually a few cut levels that appeared after defeating Rockefeller, but before entering the flea pit. These levels were Brandami Bog, Breezy Beach, and Bad Dream Fens, the first two of which are actually mentioned in the game's introduction. Unfortunately, not much is known about these levels, but there is still data in the game for them. It'd be really interesting if we could find out what these levels were going to be like. But alas, I guess it's just more video game history that's lost the time. Okay, now you're ready to dive into the flea pit. This is the source of the flea invasion, and now it's time to finally put an end to it using everything at Plock's disposal. Like his trusty... unicycle? A tank? Oh god, he even has a fucking UFO! Complete with dealy boppers! Who the fuck thought that was a good idea for those little things on your head, dealy bopper? What the f does this dealy bopper mean? Each level in this area involves Plock getting to the end of each stage using a different vehicle, which I imagine would be really jarring for first time players, because this comes out of fucking nowhere. Unless you found some of those secret warps earlier in the game. You'll end up using a unicycle, a truck, a hover jet, a bike, a helicopter, and finally the previously mentioned tank and UFO. I don't think I'd mind this change in gameplay so much if the control styles weren't so radically different between each vehicle. The unicycle isn't too bad apart from the light amount of platforming you have to do near the end of the stage, and the truck and bike aren't anything to worry about either. The hover jet can be quite finicky to get down, but I just treat it like I'm playing copter. The same with the helicopter. The tank isn't difficult to control, it's just slow as hell and I could do without it jolting back each time I fire a shot, but it's manageable. Here's a tip for this part though. Line plock up with the platform, and when you shoot the egg, Press left on the d-pad, you'll have no issues. Last of all, the UFO. My only problem with this one, it moves so fucking fast it's super easy to ram into things. Whoever designed this one to go from 1 to 1000 in one zepto second? Hope you're having a bad day. These levels really make my fingers twitch and my palms sweaty, because it can end up being quite tense. You've made it all this way and you don't want to get a game over here. But it's not the vehicles that make it this way, no. It's these bloody enemies. These guys aren't so bad aside from the amount of fucking iframes they have. These grown up flea frog fuckers can piss off. So fucking goblin! And the motherfucking flea bats. Oh, the motherfucking flea bats. As soon as you hear this sound, be prepared because one's about to zip on your screen and piss all over your day. They appear so fast and fly around so quickly it can be pretty hard to avoid them. Thankfully they only take one shot to take down though. Or you can just off screen them. Well, here we are. The flea queen and... Oh my god, what the uh, What the f uh. I'm really not sure why they made Plucky Springs in this fight. It's not like you can hurt the queen while she's at the top of the screen, but I suppose it does shake up the fight. And hey, even has a little Union Jack on his helmet. What I found works best for this fight is to only shoot her spawn when you're at ground level, and also finish the last one off while you're on the same side as she's facing, as she'll turn around when she hits the ground, making it slightly easier to avoid her projectiles. One last shot and she's done. Head to the end and you've successfully completed Plock. Oh, were you expecting some big bombastic fanfare after beating the game? Well, this is a British game after all. We don't really celebrate anything. When we accomplish something, we find the nearest comfy chair, plant our asses on them and take a well-deserved sleep. I do find this ending shot incredibly funny though. And the less we say about 3D Plock, the better. So that was Plock, and I have to say I enjoyed most of my time with this game. It's got so much personality and charm to it, you can actually see it seeping from the cartridge. But some of the bullshit can bring the experience down a bit. While I do enjoy the different gameplay mechanics, some of the flea hunting stages can last just a bit too long. However, the majority of the stages can be a really fun time to work your way through. I especially love the game's sense of humour, like how Plock gives his thoughts on his current situation throughout the game, and his little quips at the end of each stage. Like, come on, did it all again? No doubt that'll go down as one of gaming's greatest lines. I should've used that for my high school quote. I'll be honest, when I first saw the game in action, I wasn't too stuck on the graphics. However, they definitely grew on me the more I played, especially in the later stages. I get a lot of Super Mario World and Yoshi's Island vibes from them. Perhaps that's why Miyamoto was so interested in the game. Some of the stage backgrounds can look downright gorgeous at times, such as the latter half of the Cotton Islands and Crashing Rocks. The game's also built incredibly sound. I've played through it three times now and I haven't experienced any weird bugs or glitches. And on the subject of sound, I should probably stop ignoring the elephant that's in the room. I mentioned at the start of this video that mine and many others' first experience with Plock was through its soundtrack and... Man, 
What a f***ing soundtrack. Masterfully crafted and composed by Tim and Jeff Follin. Every track in this game is completely unique in its own way, and it hits you as soon as you boot the game up. The title theme is absolutely wonderful, and you should absolutely check out this cover of it by Power Slacker. My personal favourites are Beach, Acrylic, you know, the prog rock epic that has no right to go this hard, the rocket power up theme, the title theme, and of course, the boss theme. If somehow you're watching this video and don't know about Plock's soundtrack, please go do yourself a favour and listen to it. Hell, go listen to any of Tim's other work, it's all truly amazing stuff. So after that, do I recommend you play Plock? Well, yeah, of course. If you're looking for a unique 2D platform with some interesting ideas and a banging soundtrack, Plock is absolutely the game for you. Unfortunately, however, since 1993 it's never seen a re-release. Plans were made for it to come to the Wii U Virtual Console, however, it never came to fruition. So if you want to play this game, you're going to have to bust out your SNES. Or... I'm sure you could find another way to play it. It's pretty common to find cartridges for cheap here in the UK, but in the US it seems a little bit pricier. Upon release, Plock seemed to be a hit with critics, with some declaring it the best platforming game and even the best SNES release of 93. A lot of praise was rightfully given to the limb mechanics, the costume power-ups, the control, the soundtrack and the humour. There was a complete guide and review of the game in the October 1993 issue of Nintendo Power, and in the Mario Paints Player's Guide there was a section dedicated to Plock, showing how to animate him, a flea, and how to recreate the Go Home Cavern theme within the music composer. Sadly, however, even after all the praise, the game sold pretty poorly, with approximately only 420,000 copies sold worldwide. This could be attributed to the mismanaged promotion of the game. In the US, most of the advertisement was taken up by anything but Plock, and in the UK... What is this? Where's the game? Oh, there it is. Sorry, I couldn't see it because I was too distracted by this lady doing her f***ing Jedi training. Trade West was mainly responsible for these, however they did also make a couple comic strips themselves. There's not too much to them, but there's some pretty neat art. No, there was something else that was holding this game back. Like how there was an oversaturation of first person shooters in the mid 2010s and an oversaturation of battle royale games now, back in the early to mid 90s there was complete oversaturation of mascot platformers, and we can attribute that to this blue rat here. As soon as Sonic hit store shelves in 91, every company wanted their own cool, radical mascot with two to spare. Well, you got your arrow, the acrobats, your some possums, fucking Zool. The fuck is a Zool? F you, f you, f you. You're cool. And f you, I'm out. By 93, people were getting pretty sick of all these mascots. People just wanted Mario and Sonic, the top dogs of the genre. But in 93, someone else would enter the scene and make everyone scream, No more bloody mascot platformers! This character was, of course, Bubsy the motherfucking Bobcat. In a post on the Pickford's website, Steve writes that Bubsy seemed to be the game that soured the 2D character platformers genre for the masses. Some of the gameplay ideas that were new and innovative when Plock was conceived were now not as fresh as they once were, and while they were struggling to get Plock off the ground, Many other developers and publishers with far more resources were able to push their games out in a shorter time span. Plock was released a mere four months after Bubsy, and despite some great reviews, Steve believes that it was perceived as yet another bandwagon jumping cute platformer, and unfortunately, it didn't achieve the commercial success that they were hoping for. Bless you, Plock. You deserve so much better. In 2013, 20 years after the game's release, the Pickfords released a comic starring our red and yellow spud, with Volume 1 involving Plock coming to terms with the fact his game didn't sell all too well, and that he didn't get a sequel. As well as the fact that Bubsy got three. Rocky Feller and Wubby, from their N64 game Wetrix, also make an appearance, getting Plock up to date on the current state of gaming, with Volume 2 introducing the main story of the comic. I've only read up to Volume 3 and so far it's really good stuff. The artwork's great and the writing still has that Plock charm, plus it's great to see they have a sense of humour about the failure of their game. And have you ever wondered what's under Plock's gloves? If you're interested in reading the comic, you can find all volumes on their website for free. And if you want a physical copy, you can buy them off of Amazon. I've got volumes 1 and 2 here, and they even made a colouring book version of the first volume. You can also support the comic on Patreon. It's unfortunately been lying dormant for some time now. It is just a passion project after all. In 2019, the soundtrack was released on cassette, and a year later in 2020 it was released on vinyl. Eventually I'd love to own either version, but they had a very limited release, with only 100 red cassettes, 50 yellow and 500 vinyls being produced. And at these prices, I doubt I'll be getting one anytime soon. There's definitely still interest in Plock, and I'd absolutely love to see a sequel come out at some point, but... 
I just can't see that happening anytime soon. Before that though, I think Plot needs to make his way to modern platforms, especially the Switch, whether that be through the eShop or Nintendo Switch Online. Hell, I can't even see that happening though with how Nintendo's been drip feeding games to the service. We know Miyamoto likes Plock, so... Come on man, just stick it on here! It can't be that much hassle! I know John and Steve wouldn't be opposed to it. So, what are you waiting for? Go ahead and give Plock a go, and if you do end up playing it, let me know what you think. Did you like it? Did you hate it? I'd love to know, let's have a discussion about it. Are you f***ing kidding me?